welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Over the last few weeks here on Ag PhD, we've been talking about different nutrients, especially micronutrients, and today our focus is going to be manganese. Well, manganese may be important for stopping some diseases, and that could help our foliar fungicides. We're going to talk about foliar fungicides, how you can evaluate their performance. We've got an interesting Weed of the Week coming up for you later in the show, and Iron Talk as well. But first, here's this week's Farm Basics. These days, it can be hard to make the math work in your soybean fields. With the Liberty Link system with Liberty Herbicide, it gets easier. A two plus bushel per acre advantage over Asgrow Roundup ready to extend soybeans means at least $18 more an acre for you. Plus, lower system input costs and more complete weed control all adds up to at least $33 more an acre for your farm. That's smart math. Grow smart with BASF. In our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little about on-farm grain storage for farmers. Well, for farmers to get work done, they have to have the right equipment, right? That's pretty obvious. Well, when it comes to harvest time, everybody in the area harvests at the same time. And if they're all hauling to the local buyer, well, there might be big lines and the local buyer may have a breakdown or may fill up and have to shut them off for a while. So for farmers to be able to operate efficiently on their farm, they've got to have some grain storage on the farm at home. The other reason why farmers want grain storage is so they can get a better price. The big thing is, in most cases, if the farmer simply puts the grain in the bin for four to eight months, a lot of times the price just gets better. The elevator is willing to pay more because it's not as full. So over time, most farmers like us feel that grain storage will really pay. Well, this is something that becomes a big investment for farmers building grain bins or storage facilities. It's not cheap to do. So over time, it's got to pay back, as Brian mentioned, with higher prices for the grain. But certainly, uh, having that on-farm storage gives farmers the options that they need of, hey, I can sell it now if I like the price, and I can hold it for later if I want to wait. The problem here is grain quality. Just because we put great grain in the bin doesn't mean we're going to pull great grain out of the bin many months later. So we talk an awful lot here on the show and just with farmers that we work with about making sure that the bin is cleaned out well, that we spray insecticide in the bin before we put grain in there, that we have the grain down to a good temperature and down to a good moisture, and also that we have fans on the bins so if we're monitoring the bin and we say, ooh, I'm a little worried about it going out of condition, we can pump some air in there to cool it down and potentially dry it down a little bit more as well. well as you drive around the country, you'll notice that different farms have varying amounts of grain storage on the farm, and, and that's really due to a lot of different factors. I mean, every farmer runs his own business and he has the choice, do I want lots of storage so I can hold all my crop? Do I want to hold a portion of my crop? Or maybe the farmer just doesn't have very many acres either, so he doesn't have a whole lot of crop to store. There's going to be a lot of difference as you travel around the country, especially when you get into some areas that are raising uh, different crops too. But on-farm storage is a real key thing for farmers to help them manage their operations. Another key thing for farmers is controlling weeds like our Weed of the Week. Can you identify this week's weed? The buzz on this line is probably the best in 10 years, both in soil and in the plant. Joe, you've been doing this for a while. What's your take? Well, Don, you take a player like high energy in, three forms of nitrogen, but sulfur and iron with slow release technology, he's making plays all season long. Oh, look at his numbers. He's getting it done. But don't forget about in response. This guy's designed for a quick release nitrogen. It's looking like another championship season for Agro Liquid. Your planter is the single most important piece of equipment on your farm because without a uniform stand, you can't reach maximum yield. That's why Harvest International set out to design a planter that takes advantage of the newest innovations in planter technology. Built tough for high speed and integrated with the latest precision enhancements, Harvest International planters ensure every seed you plant today puts more in your bin at harvest. Harvest International, planting the future.
Morton is eager to make the building you've always dreamed of a reality. Visit us online at mortonbuildings.com. Leading the charge in strip tillage for more than a decade, the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm today. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt and a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Avoid the V-shaped pattern of injury caused by chemical buildup in your booms. The Express end cap from Hypro eliminates the dead ends that lead to herbicide buildup and provides easy access to your booms, giving a complete flush between applications. Hypro, helping you spray better. No two seasons are the same. Each brings its own set of challenges. And you've seen a few. So many threats, and not one single thing can be taken for granted. In the fight against the unpredictable, the Acceleron portfolio provides coverage on four fronts. Fungicides, insecticides, nematicides, and bioenhancers. Rise stronger with one simple decision. Our next topic is manganese. Now, we're not talking magnesium, the secondary nutrient, we're talking about manganese, the micronutrient, or MN as the elemental symbol. All right, now this may not be one you're even testing for, and I'll start here because Brian and I look at a lot of soil tests on a pretty much daily basis from all over the country and from Canada and other places around the world too. And so many of them don't even have manganese on the test. I don't understand it. I'll see N, P, and K, and maybe I'll see sulfur and zinc or something like that, but why in the world do we not have micronutrients? So as you're pulling soil tests this fall, or if you've already pulled soil tests, maybe you need to go back and pull some more and include the micronutrients. Measure things like manganese on your farm because they are important in terms of yield and other things that are other functions that are going on within the plant. All right, now Darren just told you to soil test for manganese, and I want you to as well. But here's what we've noticed over the years. There is an enormous difference in what test you run and what readings you're going to get. For example, if you run a Malik 3 test, you're probably going to see dramatically higher levels of manganese than if you run a DTPA test. Now, some of it could be true and some of it could be false. Here's what I mean. With the DTPA test, what we believe that is showing is more of what's available for manganese. With the Malik 3 test, we believe that's showing more of what there is for total in the soil. The problem with manganese is once you get to a soil pH above about a 6.5, we start really seeing manganese levels drop off. And this is verified by a lot of research work that's been done for many, many years. Manganese is just flat out less available to plants in higher soil pHs. So what we're saying here is if you're running a Malik 3 test and you've got a 7.5 pH, you may be completely misled on how much manganese is available to your plant. You can verify this by doing some plant tissue analysis work on your farm. The other thing that can really throw things off is lime applications. If you've got a low soil pH and you're trying to raise it, chances are you're putting some lime out there. Well, when you're putting a huge volume of calcium out in an application, it's going to tie some things up. And one of the things that it can hold back is manganese. So if you're in those situations where you do need to correct a low pH, and you say, hey, Brian, I, I'm at a five right now. I got a ways to go to get to that even 6.5 like you talked about. That may be one thing to think about, but as you're doing that, make sure you're supplying some manganese to your plants. And if you don't think that's such a big deal, again, take the plant tissue analysis and let the plants tell you what they need. Let me just tell you about something from our own farm. Where we've had higher pHs, we've found that we do have less manganese availability, even when we've gone out and spread a whole bunch of manganese. That's a real problem. So what we've tried to do to counteract that is just use some manganese chelate at planting time, maybe a quart or two, 
in furrow or two by two, something like that, and also doing some foliar feeding of manganese. Well, we haven't always been doing that, Brian. In fact, there's one field I was walking past uh, with Neil Kinsey, who's well-renowned around the world about uh, his expertise in soil fertility. And we were looking at some corn plants, and they're pretty small. And Neil said, wow, looks like you're really short in manganese out here. And I thought, I don't see any deficiency symptoms on the leaves. How can that be? And Neil said, no, I don't see any deficiency symptoms either. I just see very uneven emergence looking up the rows. And that's one nutrient that plays a part in getting an even emergence in your field is having plentiful manganese. Well, manganese is important for many different functions in the plant. We're not going to go all through that today. We just want you to understand, hey, this particular micronutrient is something that a lot of people are talking about with Roundup and, oh, it's getting tied up and everything else. We are absolutely not seeing that. But what we are seeing is it's getting tied up in high soil pHs, and we're finding a lot of people just flat out have not been applying manganese, yet if you pull up the Ag PhD Fertilizer Removal app and you look at at your crops you've raised for the last 20 years and look at how many pounds of manganese you've been pulling off and then you ask yourself okay I pulled off all these pounds how many have I put back it's no wonder we're seeing manganese deficiencies out there so we would just encourage you address this on your farm well, one other thing to address on your farm is weed control can you identify this week's weed of the week There are 6,272,640 square inches in an acre. We counted. Why? Because we designed the TigerMate 255 field cultivator and 2000 series early riser planter to maximize every single one. So when you create the most level seed bed in the industry and target a nickel size area to plant a seed and never miss, you'll know in high efficiency farming, there's one name to count on, Case IH. Rethink productivity. Learn more at caseih.com slash every inch. Out here, great yield starts with great weed control. That's why I choose the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the system that makes the difference. Because only I know what it takes out here. Yield's what it's all for. But keeping my fields clean all season, that's what it's all about. This is my field. Farmers across the country have put their confidence in the Roundup Ready Extend crop system. These are their experiences. My level of confidence and, and satisfaction is high right now. I am 100% satisfied with the Extend the Max with Vapor Grip technology. The yield on the Extend soybeans, I feel very confident that those are the leading soybeans on the market. It has worked 100% for us. So we're sticking 100% with it all the way right now. Morton is eager to make the building you've always dreamed of a reality. Visit us online at mortonbuildings.com. Are you looking for an easy way to apply dry powdered products to your stored grain? Do you want to use the applicator recommended by industry leaders for products like Diacon D and other dry powder products? Changing Time CT applicators successfully apply a diversity of products quickly, easily, and accurately. The innovative CT applicators are designed to give you the most accurate application of products such as talc, inoculants, fertilizers, and other dry products. For commercial use or on the farm, you need the applicator industry leaders are using. CT applicators for the changing times. 2018 was a great season to try out foliar fungicides because, let's face it, there are so many diseases out there as you went across the country that it's a great year to evaluate different timings and different products. Well, this year started out cold, then it went to really hot, then it was back cool again, but the one consistent thing we found 
in much of the country, not, certainly not everywhere, but in much of the country is it was humid and wet. And we find a lot more disease issues when it is humid and wet. Now with foliar fungicides, they can certainly help with diseases, but they've got to be out in front of it. They work best as preventatives. And I think there's some marketing around the country with different products saying, oh, this one has curative properties. But if you really look at their technical information, maybe a 3% infection, maybe a 5% infection, they can't turn around if you've got, oh no, 50% of my leaves are brown with fungus on them. Uh, no, those leaves are lost. So you've got to get that out of your head right away. You're not really going to cure a whole lot. But if you can get out there in front and time some of these things right, uh, you can stop a lot of disease from forming in your crop. And the best part about this is, is many of the diseases are pretty predictable. They're going to start after the reproductive stages of growth. So if you look at something like sclerotinia white mold, for example, in soybeans and other crops, well, if you can get out in front of that with an application right at R1, you can get you know, a lot of the blooms protected from white mold. The challenge is, well, that disease could keep coming later on in the season, as can many other diseases too. Okay, so our topic here is evaluating foliar fungicides. And the reason why we're talking about this today is hopefully you've got your yield maps from the fall. We really want you to take a look at those. But also, we want you to use a little common sense here. And if you look at your yield map and there's a 10 bushel break or a five bushel break, depending on if it's corn or soybeans or whatever crop it is, okay, that's a lot of dollars for break. You see what I'm getting at here. If I've got a 10 bushel break on corn, even if my corn's only worth $3, that's $30 an acre. $30. Okay, so if I had some investment that only cost me five or maybe 10, I mean, if I can get 30 back on that, that, that's a lot of return. I don't even have to have that much return for what I'm investing. So what I'm trying to say here is, you wanna really narrow those breaks up so you can tell if the foliar fungicide paid or if it didn't. Now, if you've spent a lot of money, like on our farm, for example, we brought a helicopter in, that cost a lot. We spent money on the very best fungicides. We also threw some foliar fertilizer in, some plant growth hormones, all that kind of stuff. And so by the time it was all said and done, we had over $30 an acre invested. All right, well now I gotta have a lot of yield gain in order to make that pay. So in that case, I don't mind having the big breaks uh, on the colors on my yield map. What we did find this year on our farm, typically the foliar fungicides at R1 do not pay on corn for us. This year they absolutely did. We're seeing a lot of 20, 30 bushel gains. So it was absolutely well worth it this year. And the reason why we did so much this year is just the way the weather was. We thought, man, if it's ever going to pay, it's gotta be this year. We were, we're set up for really good yield. There's a lot of moisture. Chances are there's gonna be a lot of disease. Well, you may make the right call in terms of which products to use and how to get them out there and the timing and all that. But if you don't get great coverage, it's going to be really tough to say, oh, you know what, that foliar fungicide didn't work. Let me give you a couple of examples. First of all, if you've got gray leaf spot, where is that at on your plant? Chances are it's head to toe. Many times it's going to start in the lower part of the plant and move up. Well, if you're only getting coverage on the top couple of leaves on 10 foot tall corn, you're just not going to get the job done. You've got to get protection at least down to the ear leaf if you want to stop gray leaf spot and keep that photosynthetic engine working for your corn plant longer into the season. So get out, do some evaluations when you're out spraying in big crop, no matter what crop it is, and see how far down through the canopy you're actually pushing it. You may have to use more water, you may have to use more pressure, you may have to get a helicopter like we did to get that push down into the crop to get the job done that you want done. The reason why Darren brings up the coverage issue is if your foliar fungicide didn't work, now we have to ask ourselves why. Did I not have good enough coverage? Did I not use the right product? Did I not have the timing right? Or was there just flat out not enough disease or enough plant health benefits that I got out of the product that I sprayed? And if that's the case, well, then I want to cut the fungicide. I don't want to spray it in the future under those same conditions. But if it's something we can control like timing or coverage or a different product, hey, we may want to be doing a bunch of experiments again next year to see if this could be something that pays for us in the long run.
Much like how we talk about weeds, there are resistance issues with certain diseases out there as well. So make sure you're using multiple modes of action. Our best luck we've had over the last few years has been using products with two or three modes of action in them and doing combinations of products since many of them have now gone off patent. You can purchase generic versions of certain products, mix them together, and create your own two or three way product to avoid resistance. Once again, we would encourage you evaluate your foliar fungicides here over the next few months when you're taking a look at your yield maps or any other data that you've got off your farm to try to figure out, is this a good investment for me next year or not? One other thing you want to keep an eye out for on your farm is our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to control it coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher with unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift and near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> This week's weed is Black Medic. We often see it get a start in the fall in many lawns. That's probably the worst place that, that we see it in. And Black Medic may look like a regular clover. A lot of people will misidentify it as a white clover, but it's not. It's a different weed and we've got to get it under control because it can take over your lawn. Yeah, it's usually an annual, like a winter annual, but it can be a biennial and occasionally it's a perennial. So that's kind of weird. We don't generally speaking have weeds that could be perennial, could be annual, could be biennial, uh, very unusual. All right, well, the big thing is what time of the year are you spraying your lawn? Now, if you say, ah, I'm spraying it to kind of late spring, you know, when things are nice out there, you probably missed the boat here. If you're spraying in the fall, especially later on in the fall, it's such a good time to hit these weeds before you get into the winter. Because now you can hit the weeds and even if you don't completely kill them, you've got winter kill coming in to knock them out the rest of the way. The other thing is if you take them out in the fall, it allows your lawn to get a really good start in the spring because the best control for a lot of weeds, including Black Medic, is to have a great crop canopy. All right, in terms of what herbicide are you going to use, we would suggest Freelex. That's the new 2,4-D with low volatility. You certainly could use Drive if you wanted to as well. We talk about that quite often for crabgrass. It also act has activity on some of the clovers, and it does pretty well on Black Medic. So if it was me, I'd probably try to get a couple shots on it, get some 2,4-D either early in the spring or late in the fall, plus some Drive uh, kind of in the late spring, early summer timing. All right, in crop fields, spring tillage generally does a pretty nice job knocking black medic out. Otherwise, if you're doing a burn down, gramoxone is highly effective. Liberty, if it was priced right, would be pretty effective on it too. So we do like Liberty Link crops, giving us the option for Liberty post emerge. Well, that's it for our Weed of the Week Black Medic, but stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. College students often get the short end of the stock when it comes to paying for an education. I'm Darren Hefty with Ag PhD, and if you seek a career in agriculture, I have great news. My brother Brian and I are hosting our first ever collegiate agronomy workshop. In addition to agricultural information, we provide you the chance to walk away with a college scholarship. The best part? Attendance is free. The workshop is on Thursday, January 3rd at the Morton Center in Baltic, South Dakota. For more information and to register, go to agphd.com. At Estes Performance Concaves, we know how valuable your time is at harvest. That's why we designed the new XPR Concave System. The XPR System is the number one performance concave system on the market, surpassing the rest in both speed and efficiency, ensuring every last grain from your field gets into your tank. Plus, XPR Concaves work for all row crops. No more changing concaves, meaning you have less downtime. Take back your bushels this harvest. Get Estes Performance Concaves in your combine today.
Commodity Classic is an early adopter's paradise. This is where what's next happens, where you can meet the people who are changing the way you farm. From the jaw-dropping trade show to outstanding educational sessions to one-on-one -on -one conversations with other farmers from across the nation, you'll be among the first to experience the new ideas, innovations, and technology that can help your operation stay profitable in times of challenge and change. Be in Orlando February 28th through March 2nd at the 2019 Commodity Classic. Visit commodityclassic.com. Let's take a look at our picks for the championship season. We've got 10-34-0. No, no, no. I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about this agro liquid team. Take a look at this lineup. They got it all. The talent, their players can meet any challenge on any field. The coaching staff, the best I've seen. So that's your pick? No discussions? Nope. Agro liquid is the team. They're going all the way to the championship. <laughs> Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. There are 6,272,640 square inches in an acre. We count it. Why? Because we designed the Tiger Mate 255 field cultivator and 2000 series early riser planter to maximize every single one. So when you create the most level seed bed in the industry and target a nickel size area to plant a seed and never miss, you'll know in high efficiency farming, there's one name to count on. Case IH. Rethink productivity. Learn more at caseih.com slash every inch. With all the shop time happening on farms right now, today's a great time to focus on grease. With a few of the basics, here's this week's Iron Talk. First of all, what is grease made of? Grease is largely made of oil. The oil serves as the primary lubricant in the grease in most situations. For this reason, grease is really not just grease. There can be a tremendous difference between the oils and types of oils used in making different types of grease. Now, in addition to oil, there are thickeners and additives. The thickeners act much like a sponge does with water. Thickeners in grease hold oil and then release it as pressure dictates that lubrication is needed. In storage, it's very common to see some of the oil come out of the solution in the grease and settle at the top. This is normal, and it really shows some of the same activity the grease will undergo as it's in use. The thickeners can also pull the oil back in to some degree as the machine they're lubricating is cooling down and not in use. The proper storage and use of grease is something that seems basic, but there are a couple of guidelines you should follow to get the most out of your grease and ultimately out of your equipment. First, with storage, grease tubes should be kept upright and off the floor. This helps maintain a consistent temperature and also keeps oils from bleeding out of the grease. Bulk grease should be kept in well-marked original containers and protected from contamination. Second, the way you use the grease is really important. The grease on the outside of the zerk is designed to keep dirt and contamination out. So it is a good idea to leave a little bit of grease on the outside of the zerk. However, cleaning that zerk off before adding more grease is important too. Also, the grease gun needs to be cleaned so that no dirt is introduced in the greasing process. Overgreasing is another common problem and certainly something we're all prone to do. For this, we'd simply recommend following the manufacturer's recommendations to avoid problems. Grease seems like a boring topic, but it certainly is a necessary thing for farm equipment. However, following these tips could help you get more out of the grease you're using and longer life out of your equipment as well. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now, back to the show. That's all for the Ag PhD TV show. We'll see you again next week. But in the meantime, we'd encourage you to check out the Ag PhD radio show. You'll find us each weekday on Sirius XM channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.